Widowed and forsaken no longer. And for those who are taking notes, just write this down beside of it as an additional thought. The blessed reversal. The blessed reversal. Barren, widowed, and forsaken no longer. Bless us, Lord, as we preach the word. May we preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel, and may we do no damage to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Barren, widowed, and forsaken no longer the blessed reversal on last Sunday I preached a message entitled the blessing as you know that message came from numbers chapter number 6 verses 22 through 27 the Lord told me he said I want you to preach and pray the blessing on my people I'm pleased to report to you that I've heard from people to whom the blessing is taking place. God is good. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord maketh his face to shine upon thee. The Lord look upon thee. God sets his countenance on thee. What a mighty God we serve. He's so good and he's so kind. After preaching the blessing, and as you know, we are in a season right now, a little time where God has me. I'm not in a series, but I am locked into fighting the right fight the right way. Right. Ephesians chapter number six. And we're doing battle with the devil and we're talking about the armor, the armor of God. And thus far we've preached about two pieces of armor. We've talked about uh, the girdle, the belt of truth your loins girt about with the truth and on this past Thursday night we talked about the breastplate of righteousness and that righteousness was not self-righteousness nor is it imputed righteousness but practical righteousness it is so important that but that the believer who has been saved by the God of the Bible and stamped righteous spiritually that practically we live out who and what we are spiritually much damage has been done to the kingdom of God because too many Christians fail to live this thing practically we are saved but we cuss saved but we fornicate claim to know Jesus but drink we you know we, I, we went too far with the uh, doctrine with the, char the charisma the charismatic movement, the free grace, the grace gift thing to the point where uh, we said uh, it doesn't matter how you live, you, you're saved by grace, but it matters how you live. And we went to the scriptures and showed where Paul even encouraged them in a practical way to live right. People want to see Christians who are living this thing. They'll hear you if you live it. But if on the job you cheat like they do, if in the classroom you do like they do, if, if when you get angry you behave the way they behave, then you, 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 they may like you and you all may be cool until you try to call them out or bring correction and they'll tell you right quick, hey, you're just like me. You can't tell me anything. So it is so important that practically we, we, we live this life. And uh, having your lawns girded about with truth, the believer should care about truth and being a truthful person. Right. Believers ought not to spend all their time um, um, becoming experts on how to get away. Right. 
with things and how to do underhanded things, just not get caught. No, the, the believer should just live clean. Right. Things that I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Right. I came out. The Lord saved me. And I, and I want to be able to look my wife in the eye, my husband in the eye. I want to be able to look my children in the eye. When I tell them I was in such such a place, that you, you were actually there. Truthful. It matters. It's supposed to matter to the believer. So between talking about uh, these pieces of armor, are you following me? God says, preach and pronounce the blessing. We did that. After Sunday, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was preaching from Isaiah chapter number 54. And of course, in my dream, and you preaching from Isaiah chapter number 54, you know verse 17 has got to be in it somewhere. Because probably the most popular verse in Isaiah chapter number 54 is verse 17. And we all know it. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And, and it should be popular because it is true. And I thank God that that's in the Bible because there are so many weapons that get formed against the believer, formed against the church. Praise the Lord. And God says, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment. Don't worry about the people who are making accusations and all that. Say what you want to. Say what you will or may. But God says, every one of them, thou shall condemn. And he, then he says, and this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Not servant, but servants. All of God's servants have this heritage because of something, and I'll show you in a few minutes, that God's righteous servant did. The servant of the Lord did something that bequeathed a heritage to every servant of the Lord who carries on, who carries out, and continues in the legacy of God's righteous servant. And his righteous servant is Jesus Christ. And when we live for Christ, the Lord promised a particular blessing for the saints who live for Christ. The six verses preceding the 17th verse of, uh, of Isaiah uh, chapter number uh, 54 are very powerful because in verse number 11 the prophet switches his attention to from the the northern kingdom and Israel uh, the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom Judah but Jerusalem in particular and he begins to prophesy of a divine makeover a divine reversal, a divine remake that God is going to do to Jerusalem. He says in verse 11, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempests, and not comforted, behold, I will lay stones with fair colors and thy foundations with sapphires. He says to Judah, even though right now you're in ruins, I'm going to rebuild your wall. I'm going to rebuild your infrastructure. And how many know when God gets ready to rebuild the infrastructure, it doesn't have to be a massive $3 trillion uh, tax bill. Say amen. And he says, I'm going to rebuild. And, and listen, if you, if you think what God has done in, in Jerusalem is, is amazing right now, and it's, it's, if you know anything about the, the history of Israel, it is, it is a wonder. It is a wonder. It, it is amazing that Israel exists. Amen. That there is a place on earth today called Jerusalem is a miracle in and of itself. With the attacks, with the things that have happened to that little tiny 
the piece of land, not much greater, if larger, than the state of Florida, designated by God to be the most beautiful place on earth. The Bible says that, that Jerusalem is beautifully, Zion is beautifully situated in the earth. Surrounded by enemy nations. For a long time the Jews were driven from their homeland. But God promised. He says, I have made a covenant of loving kindness with you. So as far as I'm concerned, it's like the waters of Noah. I promise that those waters again would never flood the whole earth. He says to Zion, I promise you, you will never be separated from your homeland. You will never not exist. You will never not be a people. America may be, and I'm, I'm being kind to mention may, America is dying. Our great land, and I love this country. I'm proud to be an American. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not with the anti-American crowd. I hate this country. I'm a black man living in America. Opposed to being a black man living anywhere else. Where, where else do you want, where else can a black man live and make what we make in America. Raise your hand, name some places, and do as well as we do overall in America. In America. And have the opportunities that we have here. There's a reason that people fight so hard to get into America. Praise the Lord. And, and, and I say this from time to time, and people get mad, but you know, you have, they're your emotions. Get any way you want. I don't care. The wrong things are told to African Americans. Other people come here and prosper. Hispanics, again, their own banks. Every time, everywhere you look now, drive home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon in the rush hour traffic. I'll be looking for the black folk in the cars. See what's going on. Drive past work sites. See what's happening. Where are our people? Now, if you go to any abortion clinic, you can find a steady stream of them every Saturday going down there to kill them babies. But, but notice this. And now they're flying uh, Afghanis, Afghanis into the country, dropping them off. Now let's watch that development. You're bringing people in here who do not respect our laws, do not respect our culture. Women, they don't view you like Christianized men view women. All women should love Christianity because it was Christianity that raised the value of the woman to where she is today. It, it, is the, it is Christian teachings that says giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. It is Christian teachings that says thou shall not lay with mankind as with womankind. It is in the Bible where we find Solomon as, and in the Song of Solomon, as he described the beauty of his wife and how precious she is. It is in Proverbs that we find the writings and the teachings of the virtuous woman. Oh yeah. It's in the Bible where we find Jesus dying on the cross. Dying on the cross. Dying for the sins of everybody. And he interrupted death and said, wait a minute, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't die yet. Hey, John, John. John said, yes. He said, hey, man, take care of my mother. And said to Mary, John's got you until I come back. Then he went on in. Showing a son how to treat his mother. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. It's in the Bible. 
It's in the Bible. But men are taught chivalry and to work and to respect the woman. It's in the Bible that fathers are taught not to provoke their children. Yes, we are disciplined, but, but you don't go overboard. Yeah, that's good preaching. And now we're bringing people in. We're bringing people in whose culture and the books they've been reading teach men to beat the woman, to flog her. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Tell you to go to your room and, tell you, and you can't come out for a week. And you know what? You, they go in there and stay. The cultures are different. And we're bringing them in and we're dropping them off right here in America. Our country's in trouble. The debt load is one that uh, them little children, barley boys, would you all stand a little barley? Y'all stand up. You see them fine, handsome young men, them boys. Their children, children, will be paying the debt back that we're accumulating now. And we're, and, and we're still trying to add trillions to that debt. The dollar is in trouble. And, and, and this, kind, this kind of spending can't go on forever. See, the, pro, the problem with socialism is, uh, as we move, to, thank you, y'all might be seeing, as we move to more of a socialist form of government, the problem with socialism is, sooner or later, you run out of other people's money. So the government gives me free money every month. No, 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 no. That money comes from someone else. And most of the, the, the numbers that they give us, and, talk, and they talk about people in poverty, those numbers are not accurate because when they talk about people in poverty, they do not include grants and other government help monthly handouts, they don't count that as income. So you may actually be, uh, in terms of what you work and make, live underneath the poverty line, but by the time you finish all of the other freebies that you can apply for, oh man, you got a good thing going. You're doing better than most people who are middle class. Why do you think it's so hard right now to find people who will work. I went to I went to uh, I went to uh, Chick Fil A yesterday. I, I went there around about two o'clock. Clothes, sign on it, due to no help. So I walked across the street. Well, let me go over here if I can't get some chicken. <laughs> let, me, let me at least get a cup of coffee. Went to a uh, Starbucks. Clothes, no help. I had to go to two or three different, when I finally pulled a, a door and the thing opened, I, I walked in the, in the restaurant and told the people, thank God for you. <laughs> when you start paying people not to work, right. the country's in trouble. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching. Right. Our country has turned its back on God. And uh, I, there's so much I can say on it. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, now you can never in this life call former President Donald Trump a bully if you don't call Joe one for what he said the other day. Now you're talking about bully. The President of the United States telling people we've been, our patience is running out. Running out on what? on whether or not we let you put a shot in us. I mean, I didn't know we elected a king. A king. I thought we elected a president. Now, whoever wrote that speech for him, he didn't write it. You know he didn't write it. Because if you're talking about something that important, why don't you stand and take questions? Why don't you explain to the people what, what you mean? You can't just dictate and then walk off. Unless you're not quite, unless you can't defend your argument. If anybody want to discuss any of this with me, make an appointment, I'll be glad to, because I love to talk about stuff like this. Because I know where I'm coming from. And um, 
And when we talk, you'll notice that I won't scream, I won't holler, I don't get mad and all that kind of stuff. You know, some people, because they can't defend their argument, they call your names, they get mad, and they, they, they get emotional. That's a sign that they can't defend their position. But we're being bullied. And Americans now, the man said he was going to be a uniter. Campaign on uniting America. Now he's dividing people on the basis of vaccines. He said that this is a this is a um, um, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. I got this uh, notice from um, someone the other day in our in our national church. Someone wrote in and said, "My family and my family, eight people have COVID. Seven were fully vaccinated." Two of the fully vaccinated are in ICU. One is about to have the plug pulled. Have been on a ventilator for 15 days. The lone unvaccinated person is now in the hospital. But the rest of them that got sick are doing better. It closes with a very good line. COVID makes no sense. It hits hard and can kill you even if you're vaccinated. This wasn't from a politician. It's from a regular person whose family went through. The point is, you better put your faith in the Lord. That's the point. See, that, that's, 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 that's what we used to preach. That's what we used to preach. That's what we used to tell people. Matter of fact, I shouldn't tell you all this, but I'm working on a sermon right now. I shouldn't tell you. Entitled, I still preach what I used to preach. Right. Yeah, I'm not changing my gospel. See, I still have the same Messiah, same Savior, same Bible. God is still a healer. He's still a way maker. And if you live... It's because the Lord let you live. And when we die, it's because God said it's time to go home. Whether you have the shot or not. My faith is not in a vaccinated status or a unvaccinated status. My faith is in the Lord. Well, I'm vaccinated, so I'm safe. Safe from what? You ain't safe from that bullet that may go through your head. You're not safe from cancer. You're not safe from all the other conditions that kill 150,000 people every day, pre-COVID. 8,000 every day in this country, pre-COVID. Before we know, knew anything about COVID, while they were doing gain of function testing to make the thing uh, worse than what it would have been, people are dying. You know why? Because the Bible says it is once appointed unto man to die. And after death, the judgment. That's true. That's Bible. But the saints used to believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm, I'm so glad I got saved when I did. I'm, I'm going to move on. I'm spending too much time on this. I'm going to move. I'm so glad I got saved when I did. I'm glad I got saved. Mother, you know I can still hear the late Elder Herbert Bullock singing, Oh, heaven, heaven is mine. Don't you want to go to heaven? Heaven is mine. And if he, if he sung that today, Oh, heaven, heaven is mine. Don't you want to go to heaven? Saints said, No. <laughs> Cut that song. We don't want to hear anything about going to heaven. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's why so many Christians are depressed. The Bible says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are above all men most miserable. Our greatest joy is not supposed to be tied to the Lord giving us a new house, a new suit, or a new car. Our greatest joy is supposed to be tied to the blessed hope, which is the rapture of the church of God, which is in Christ at his return. Ah, let me move quicker. But I'm just telling you. He says, he says, Jerusalem, I'm gonna, I'm gonna redo you. 
And you know what? In Revelations, America, you, 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 you have an expiration date. I hate to say it, but you do. We do, we do. But Jerusalem doesn't. The Bible says in Revelations 21 and 2, 1 and 2, 21 verse 1 through 2, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw, look at this, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God says, I promise you, Jerusalem. I promise you. I'm going to redo you. I'm going to make you over. But you have a glorious future. Are you praying for me? And he says to Jerusalem, not only will I bless you, but I will bless your citizens. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness thou shalt be established. And thou shalt be far from oppression. God's going to do a reversal. The word oppression there, the, the, the word there, that's tyranny. And we're living in a day where tyrants are out. The cancel culture is a tyrant. You say something uh, that they don't like and they try to have you deplatformed, put you off of Facebook, put you off of YouTube. And there's a lot of social public shaming going on. I want to say this to you. You can't move me to do anything you want me to do by trying to embarrass me on social media. You can post whatever you want. Some of these cryptid messages, all that stuff. Uh, if, you, if you want, Patrick, you, you want me to, to move like cement. Try something like that. Because I don't care what people read on uh, social media. Well, I got uh, 300,000 friends. I don't care if you got 3 million. Makes no difference to me. Saints have began to do on social media what God told you to do to the individual. The Bible says if you think someone has an alt against you, go to them. Show me in the Bible where the Bible says uh, post it. Come on, after service, I'll give you $1,000 cash. Show me in the Bible where the Bible says, let your first move to be to post it. You know what that is? That is carnality at its best. Carnality and cowardice. And then when you call them on it, oh, I wasn't talking about you. That's carnality. That's carnality. Now you can try to dress it up. You can try to dress it up all you want, but that's carnality. If someone is doing something to you, the Bible says, go to them. If they won't hear you, the Bible says, get some witnesses and go to them. If they won't hear them, the Bible says, bring it before the church. If they won't hear the church, the Bible says, the church told the church to put them out. Now that, that, that's what we need to post. Well, the, 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 the tyranny, look at how people's jobs are being threatened. And by the way, if it is as bad as the president said it is, and if it's so necessary, it's going to take your job if you don't get the shot, putting pressure on you and all that kind of stuff. How did, in less than 24 hours, the whole post office get exempt? The whole, the office. The whole postal service. Don't, nobody in the postal service have to get a shot. They're exempt from the whole thing. Now, that's over 600,000 people. Now, either it's that bad or it's not. The whole post office. These are, these are the kind of questions that you should be asking. I think, I think they're reasonable questions. They're government workers. Praise the Lord. They're government workers. Now, whether or not you want to get a shot, that's your business. I don't talk to people about that. Don't call me asking me about it. You didn't ask me about the last shot you got, did you? So I don't want to know about this one. That's, that's your business. 
But my point is, I'm, I'm not talking about shock as much as I'm talking about this tyranny. Saying it's not about your rights. It is. It is. It's about our rights and it's about the law. Now let me prophesy to you. You are, you are seeing a precursor. You're seeing the, the, the foundations being laid to promote the mark of the beast. You are seeing how they're going to do it. Threaten people's jobs, threaten people's livelihood, threaten people's lives. And I'll tell you what's, going, what's necessary. The people need to stand together. That's what needs to happen. You can't, you, you can't fire everybody. Well, if my workers don't, uh, if they don't have a certain status, I'm going to let them all go. All the workers need to walk out right then. He'll drop that. If you drop that because you can't run you can't run a restaurant and cook the food and buff the tables and wash the dishes and answer the phone and escort people to their seat you can't do it you can't run a business I know I'd be in trouble up here in my administration if the ladies who work for me I, all of them walk out at one time I, I wouldn't last a day trying to answer the phone, trying to answer the door, trying to answer uh, uh, FedEx, UPS, uh, UPS, all of them. Praise the Lord. Emails coming in, text coming in, this coming in, that. Oh, Lord, you find me just holding the altar saying, Lord, I can't take this. It's too much. It's too much. Are you praying for me? I got to move on. But, but see, this tyranny and God gives us a promise. He says, thou shalt be far from oppression. Don't you be afraid. God's got your job. God's got your life. He has everything in his hands. And he's coming back. He's coming back to get us. But until he comes, he's still a keeper. He's still a way maker. He's still God. He's yet God. Thank you. And he promised them you will be far from oppression. And I want to say to the believers out there who are watching, don't you be afraid. See, these are times that test men's souls. And it's time for the saints to do like everyone else. It's time for the saints to dig in dig in. See, we're not going to get anywhere being wish-washy and uh, uh, docile and oh my, we have the, we've we, we become uh, liquid. Praise the Lord. We, whatever, whichever way they turn us, that's the way we flow. No, 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 no. It's time to make you stay. It's time to make you stay. And I found out with God, if you stand, he'll stand with you. He's just looking for somebody who will stand. Praise the Lord. Moses stood. Noah stood. Elijah stood. Elisha stood. Daniel stood. Nehemiah stood. See, when you go down the list, you got to stand. John the Baptist stood. Who's on the Lord's side? He promised us we will be far from tyranny. And then he says, and look at this. This is for your jobs. And from terror. That is from ruin. Nobody wants to lose their house, their cars. Nobody wants to lose all that they've worked for. And that's what the devil trying to threaten you with, with ruin, terror, ruin. God will take care of his own. Amen. And from ruin, for it shall not come near thee. It shall not come near thee. And then he lets us know that he's really in charge. He says, behold, they shall surely gather together. So now they're going to they're gonna be conspiracies. Now people say, I don't believe in conspiracies. The greatest conspiracy of, of them all is the conspiracy that convinced people that there are no conspiracies. That's the greatest one. Once you've gotten convinced that there are no conspiracies, now you're where the devil wants you. Conspiracy is mentioned at least five times in the Bible. 
They conspired against Jesus. They conspired against Jesus. They conspired against Paul. They conspired against the apostles. And I want you to know right now somebody's conspiring against you. They're conspiring against me. The Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity, Paul says, is all, that is already at work, is a conspiracy. All Antichrist is a conspiracy. They're conspiring. And God says, yes, yeah, they shall gather together. He said, but don't worry about it. I'm not in it. He says, but not by me. I'm not in it. See, if God is not in it, then you ain't got to fight it because it'll come to naught anyhow. If the Lord is not in it, then it's already defeated. It's like the snake with his head cut off. The rest of it is still, the, the, the tail is moving, but he's dead. God said, they're going to gather, but not by me. And then he says, whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. And he says, I'm in charge. I created the smith that blow the coals in the fire that bring forth at the instrument of his work. He says, I'm the one who is in control of the uh, people uh, who make weapons. I'm the one. I'm the one who uh, created the waster to destroy. Having said that, I want you to know no weapon. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against you in judgment, let them talk. Let them talk. Every tongue that shall rise up against you in judgment, God said, thou shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants. Of the Lord. This is for all of us. You ought to grab your heritage and your inheritance and say, oh God, I believe. Let, let me move on from this. Or I'm preaching verses that's not even in my text. You know that's not proper. Amen. But see, the, uh, this was about Jerusalem's glorious future. Uh, God's going to make it over. But in verse 1 through 10, are you praying for me? Yes, sir. Verse 1 through 10, he speaks to the northern kingdom. He speaks to Israel at large. And this doesn't exclude the southern kingdom because God knew even in the days of uh, the prophet Isaiah that the day would come when Israel would no longer be divided into northern and southern kingdoms as it is today. It's not divided. It's one Israel. Even when Jesus walked the earth, there was one uh, Israel. There was Samaria. But we, we and, 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 the, and the land of Samaria was the home of the northern kingdom because Israel had it first. In 2 Kings chapter 17, you see what happened. The Assyrians caused the, uh, conquered uh, the Israelis and they repatriated the land with Samaritans and that's how it became the land of Samarita, uh, Samaria. But God brought it back. So let me show you something here. In, um, I, want to, I want to mention this. Uh, this is just for the, the Bible buffs out there. and We're getting ready to take off in a minute and we're going home because we've got to come back tonight and pray. But for you Bible buffs, and I realize not, not everybody is, everyone ought to be. You ought to love the Bible. You ought to love the construction of the Bible. The nuances. Yes. The hyphens. The commas. The colons and semicolons. Everything that has anything to do with the Bible, you ought to love it. The mood of the Bible, the mood of the prophet shifts abruptly from chapter 53 to chapter 54. And, the, and there's a good reason for this shift. Something happened in chapter 53 that is the cause for the joy of chapter 54 that gives us joy today. What happened? It was something that God's righteous, listen to this, servant did. Not servants, but his servant 
did something that guaranteed the glorious future for Israel, for Judah, and for us. And we see it in chapter 53, verse 10. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. For he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, Jesus died for us. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. He's talking about what Christ will do on the cross for us. I said earlier today, and I'll say to you, be careful when you tell your story. Always link your story to God's story. See, we're quick to say, neighbor, if you knew my, there's nothing wrong with neighbor, if you knew my story, you would understand my glory. But your personal testimony is not the source of your joy. It's what Christ did for us. Jesus died. The Lord told me, warn the believers about this because people are moving away from Christ's story. And so we think our testimony is more interesting, but it's not. What Jesus did on the cross, unless you tie your, uh, what happened to you to what Jesus did, then nobody's gonna get saved just because you were born in hardship or just because you made it. It's got to be tied to what Jesus did on the cross. He shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant, singular, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and the spoil with the, look, look at this, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the portion with the strong saints because he have poured out his soul unto death because Jesus died for us. I can't thank him enough for dying on the cross for my sins. And he was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sins of many and made intercessions for the transgressors. Jesus interceded on our behalf. And because of what God's righteous servant did because of what he would do as Isaiah prophesied we find the prophet in chapter 54 shifting from the pain of the and the death of the righteous servant but the results of his death brings forth joy to the barren so he shifts from the gloominess of 53 and he goes to the joy of 54 and he says to of all people the barren he says sing sing oh barren woman sing I ain't got nothing to sing about yes you do and notice this he didn't say you had to be able to sing See, in God, you don't have to win a Grammy to sing. So just sing. Everybody's got something to sing about. Everybody's got something to shout about. If nothing else, you sing because Christ triumphed on your behalf. In Isaiah 53 and 11, you see as he, that he mentions the righteous servant. In 54 and 17, he mentions the, inherit, the heritage of his servants. Because of what Jesus did, we have this heritage. Are you praying for me? And so as a result of this uh, incredible triumph, he prophesies that a new age is coming. A new age. And the proper response to the new age is joyous praise. To make the point, he uses three metaphors. A barren woman, a widow and a forsaken woman. And he promises all three that in this new age, the reason you should sing is that no matter how low your situation may be, I promise you that a reversal is coming. 
That gives you hope. Won't be this way always. There is something that God is up to. In times like these, we need to be reminded that the God of the Bible is in control. And one of the things that helps us, and I can't go into it due to time, but if you read at your leisure, 2 Kings chapter 16, it's about Judah. And 2 Kings chapter 17, that records the fall of the northern kingdom. And 2 Kings chapter 18, the challenge of Sennacherib and how God raised up Hezekiah and gave him victory. When you read these things, and then you read in 2 Kings chapter 21, the wicked reign of, the, of King Manasseh, then you see the context that the prophet Isaiah prophesied in. Isaiah, when he spoke these words, the society of uh, the northern kingdom and of Judah was very much like America is today. One of the things that they were doing was they were boarding babies left and right. In the northern kingdom, they were feeding their children to the false god Molech. Molech is the god of convenience. I can't get any help. He's the god that they thought controlled the weather. And they felt that if they would just sacrifice their children to Molech, their lives would get better. 98% of all abortions are had because the child is a nuisance. When they talk about rape and incest, rape and incest accounts for less than one and one and a half percent of all abortions. All of them, less than one percent. The preacher uh, criticized the Texas law. Bishop Paul Martin said to the people of Texas, shame on you. What kind of bishop would say that? Because, because they passed the law, you know, in six weeks, the heart begins to beat in the baby. The heartbeat starts. So in the state of Texas, I sure hope we do it in North Carolina, in the state of Texas, they passed a law where once that heart starts beating, you can't kill the baby. Now what Christian would have a problem with that? What bishop would have a problem with that? What person who claims to be sanctified would have an issue with that? And yet we find sanctified folk who have issues with stuff like that. And I believe, saints, that we've made a big mistake. I believe that we're putting political parties ahead of our Christianity. You can't be a Democrat before you are a Christian. You can't be a Republican before you are a Christian. We're Christians first. Praise the Lord. And our Christianity ought to govern everything. And uh, if any party passes something into law that violates your Christian belief, you ought not to support that. That's why, that's why I am a registered non-affiliate and independent. Praise the Lord. There ain't no way in this world I could be a registered uh, Democrat with them supporting same-sex marriage, supporting abortion, supporting transgenderism, supporting uh, uh, socialism, supporting things that the Bible says wrong. Now, how you going to be saved? sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and then support things that God says are wrong. Uh, somebody actually wrote me and said, uh, well, what about uh, the Republicans? I wrote them back. I said, I'm not a Republican, but I asked them. I said, can you tell me one law that they passed that was against your Christian values? Well, write me, write me, write me, call me, call me, call me. I had, hey, I hadn't got any takers yet. I said one day publicly here, I said it publicly, and I said it to my friends online. Nobody's called me yet. When uh, Donald Trump was president, I said, I'm not talking about his personality. I'm not talking about his tweets. I'm not talking about his language. What I'm talking about is one thing, his policies. Would you tell me one policy that he promoted? Just one. I don't want to. Just one that was against biblical teachings. Nobody's called me yet. Nobody's called me yet. Nobody's written me, written me. 
But as soon as the man who's in office got in now, we started to pay for aborted babies overseas. As soon as he got then the man who's in there now, who said while he was running that if a nine-year-old wanted to get a sex change operation, that that child should not be discriminated against. That's wickedness. What kind of parent would let their nine-year-old boy get his penis removed because he thinks at nine he's a girl? You you better be concerned about what he's going to think when he's 10. Come on, the child should be supported and a person can say stuff like that and still have your support. Something's wrong. We got to be Christians first. Christians first. Mm, somebody better pray for me. Yes, sir. We're in a time, we're in a wicked day. They were just like they were when Isaiah prophesied this. The children were being aborted in the streets and they brought false gods. They, put, they took the brazen altar that was in the sanctuary and moved it to a less conspicuous place and put an altar to a false god in the main place. And we're living in a day now where America gives more support, more respect, to the religion of our enemies than they do to the religion that made this country great. We pay more, we give more respect to Islam and Buddhism and all these other isms, especially in Hollywood. They give respect, they, they show the Muslim uh, on television and in the movies in a respectful way. They show the Buddhists in a respectful way, but they're gonna make a fool out the Christian every time. That's the way of the world, that's the way of the world. And that's the way it was when the prophet Isaiah prophesied and said, Baron, you better sing. Why? Well, Baron, Baron, now he's using women as a metaphor, but he's not talking about the female per se. He's talking about the nation. And I want to say to my wonderful black community, I'm a proud African-American male. I'm a proud black man. I wouldn't have it any other way. I don't know life any other way. I don't, I'm not white. I don't envy the white man. I imagine he's glad to be white. But he's no gladder to be white than I am to be black. And I imagine you ladies are glad to be female, but you're no more glad that you're a female than I am that I'm a male. I'm so glad God got it right the first time. The Bible says, woe be unto him who strives with his maker. My maker didn't make a mistake when he made me the way he made me. And I thank God for my maker. And I thank God for what he did. But I'm telling you, the wrong things has been said to us. So because we're barren, not that we're not giving birth, but we're barren. Why can't we grow beyond 13% of the population? The Hispanics are growing, others are growing, but black folk have stopped growing. We're killing our children in the streets and what the abortion clinic doesn't do, we do to each other. It's time to turn from this stuff and turn back to God. Come on back to church. And then when you get to the church house, how about preacher preaching the Bible? How about telling people what God said? How about declaring thus saith the Lord? You don't hear what I'm saying? God said to the barren, you better sing. He said, don't just sing, but break forth into singing. Break out. Sing like you sing when you're in the shower. Sing like you sing when you're in a place and you don't think anybody can hear you. And when you sing, he said, cry loud. Make sure you sing and you sing loud. Now you have to wonder why would he tell the baron to sing? Because you see in uh, biblical times, the childless woman, a woman who was childless, she was scorned, she was made fun of, and in many cases, she was replaced by what is called a secondary wife. And that secondary wife would have the children. 
except for the husband. And he's having all the babies by the secondary wife. You saw what happened with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Hagar and Sarah got along until Hagar became a secondary wife. Her spirit changed because she delivered something to Abraham that Sarah couldn't deliver and it divided the house. Sarah didn't like her position and God said to the barren woman who was placed in a position of disadvantage, the barren woman who was dismissed by her husband, the barren woman who because she had no children and had no husband, then therefore in her old age, she was vulnerable because she had nobody to look out for her. And she looked over and there was the secondary wife with all the children. She's got all of the support. She's living in the house. She's sleeping in the bed. Everything is going her way. When the legitimate wife, because she couldn't have a baby, she's out in the cold. She's afraid. She's vulnerable. She's messed up. But I had the Lord say, I know you are in a bad way, but a divine reversal is about to take place. So I'm telling that barren woman, you may as well begin to sing because I'm getting ready to do something miraculous. I wonder, is there anybody here who will break out in praise right now? Even though you don't see it, the Lord told me to tell you that a change, a reversal, a turning it around is on the way. Yeah! for yourself claim it for yourself claim it for yourself if you felt like you were on the outside looking in claim deliverance for yourself if you feel like you were misused mistreated left up throw up your hands and praise the Lord because the Lord, oh, the Lord is going to turn it around. Yeah, yeah. If you believe it, let me hear you praise him. a 360 because if he does a 360 degree turn you will end up where you started but God is doing a 180 whereas you were headed off the cliff Somebody dance with you if you believe. 
said, Baron, you're going to need a realtor. Hold on. Baron, you're going to need a real estate agent. He said, oh. Verse 2, he said, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitation. Spare not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. You need to get a new house. You're going to need a bigger place. You're going to prophesy to somebody. And tell them you're going to need a bigger place. Yeah! Because I heard the Lord say in verse 3, Baron, you're going to break forth on the right hand. Break forth on the left hand. Children are coming from everywhere. Children, I know you never gave birth, but I'm going to bless you with children everywhere. Yeah! I wonder, can I get somebody to praise the Lord for the blessing, to praise the Lord for what's coming in the midst of all this trouble, in the midst of all this strife. God made a promise. Yes, he did. Can you say yeah? Yeah, Lord. I wish I could get about, I wish I could get about 10 people who say, who say well, preacher, I'll tell you, to be honest, in my situation, I just can't see that happening. I wonder if I get about 10 who are there to just praise him like they, even though you can't see it, you praise him anyhow. Because if you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. But if you can see it,
well, I got promises for today. Galatians 4, 27 says, for it is written, rejoice thou barren that did is not bear. I mean, Galatians now, break forth and cry thou that did is not travail. For the desolate have many more children than she that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? It says, cast out the born bond woman and her son. For the bond bound woman, bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we, talking to the Galatians, are not of the children of the bond woman, but of the free. Galatians were Gentiles. Galatians were not Jews. And yet here's Paul telling them that we're all of the free woman. Because when you're in Jesus, you're free indeed. How many are glad to be free? How many are glad to be a part of this divine reversal? With the time, with my time running out, he went, he goes from the barren, he goes from the barren to the widow. And he tells the widow, and in those societies, the only woman whose fate was worse than the barren was the widow. The widow was in bad shape. Widows had nobody to protect them. Widows had no husbands. Widows often had no children. The widow had no one. Ah, and yet God spoke to the widow and said to the widow, fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither shall thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. Notice how he says it. You won't be ashamed, don't be confused, you're not gonna be put to shame, you won't even remember the shame of your youth. And thou and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. The pain from that, God says, I'm, I'm going to bless you where you won't even remember it. And he says, widow, for thy maker is thy husband. What? She's a widow. Your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And check this out. And he is thy redeemer. I'm going to redeem you from widowhood. And who's going to do it? The God of the whole earth is what he shall be called. And then he moves to the last woman. And that's the woman, ladies, whose husband, he hadn't divorced her, but he left her. He forsook her. You, you really see in this Hosea, who was a contemporary of Isaiah and Goma. God told Hosea, marry a woman who was a whore. She was a whorish woman. She was an unfaithful wife. And God told the prophet to marry her. And the, the, the picture here was how God deals with Israel. See, because God is faithful. God is faithful. But Israel wasn't. God is faithful to us. But more, many times we're not faithful to him. And in order to get us where we should be, sometimes you have no choice but to have to step back. And he says, you were like an estranged woman. He says, verse 6, For the Lord called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife of youth, see she's married, when thou wast refused, that is cast off, saith 
thy God. And then he says in verse 7, For a small moment I forsook you, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little, in a little wrath I hid my face from you. Yes, for a moment. And the Assyrians conquered the land. Look how God views time. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee. And saith the Lord thy God. And for the time that they spent in Assyrian bondage, look at all the years that they've been free. When you compare the time, it was just a few years. So God says it's just like the waters of Noah. I'm never going to leave you like I left you then. I promise you that. And they exist today because of God's covenant. He turned it. For all three women. These metaphors. Barren, sing. Widow, your widowhood is over. Hey girl, your husband came back. And when he came home, he came right. And you received him because you, in this case, he had no choice but to leave because she wouldn't do right. God is perfect. God couldn't have forsaken them for a moment and been at fault because he's God. But he had to forsake his own because they wouldn't hear him. And then when they got to where he would hear him, they would hear him, he came back. The point is, he did reversals for all three. And he promised, he told me to tell you that in this time, See, I don't want to wait until it looks like it's over. That's, that's what leaders do. Leaders lead. Sometimes we say things that you don't understand, but even if you don't understand them, don't talk about us. Because we don't arrive at the same place at the same time. You're not the watchman. So it stands to reason that the watchman can see things that the regular member can't see. So if the watchman says something, you don't, you don't go home and over the dinner table have roasted watchman. You say, man, I'm going to be on the lookout for that. And you watch and see. I want to tell you, while we're in the throes of this, while the tyranny of the White House is going on, while the LBGT and all these people have gone crazy. I mean, the same day you get on people for not taking a shot, they sue the state of Texas for trying to save babies. Um, Lord help us. God says in the midst of all this, I'm doing a reversal. I'm going to bless you. Hallelujah. And I believe it. The same God who have brought us to where we are today. Week 69. Who would have thought? We had no way of knowing when we came out the blocks what would be. Everybody's talking. What wouldn't got them doing now? They're crazy. They all die. 69 weeks later, we're here. In the name of the Lord. And we're not here because we've been so righteous. We've been so intelligent. We're so smart. None of that stuff. That'll get you killed. We're here because God is good. And the Lord is merciful. And he wants to bless you. He wants to turn it around. If there's some things that you want God to reverse for you, you need from him some things you can't turn there's nothing that he can't turn people are concerned about their jobs people are concerned about how this new tyranny this new pressure is going to play out people are concerned hallelujah 
I want to challenge you today to put your concerns in the hands of the Lord. We're going we're gonna to cast today. We're going to throw. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth. If I'm talking to you, stand at your seat. I want to pray for you. If I'm talking to you, God turn this for me. God turn this for me. Hallelujah. God turn this for me. Hallelujah. Of course, just that would have come. Just that would have come. Amen. Somebody got to know they sent this note up here. Okay. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, you're the God of all flesh. You're the God who made heaven and earth. You're the God who will not suffer our foot to be moved. You're the keeper and the lifter of our head. And you're also the God who promised in the midst of the turmoil that was taking place during the rains of the kings of both Judah and Israel. During Jotham's reign and Ahaz's reign, Hezekiah's reign, other kings, when sin was entrenched in the land and the people had become spiritually destitute. Yet through Hosea and Amos and Isaiah, and others, you prophesied of a reversal. God, we ask that you perform a reversal in the lives of the saints, in the lives of the people who are gathered here now. In the name of Jesus, the Lord told me to tell you he's turning things. Just trust him. Those who are streaming, those who are watching, the prayer, there's no distance in prayer. The prayer goes the way you are today. God's turning things. God's watching right now. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we grab it. God, we believe it. We hold on to it. In the name of Jesus. You know what we need. You know where we are. We ask you, oh God, we ask, oh God, that your glory prevail, that your glory prevail, and that this divine, oh my, reversal that causes the barren to sing, that causes the widow to no longer be ashamed, that causes this strained, this estranged woman to be comforted that kind of reversal we thank you for it right now we receive it and we sing to you and we praise you and we give you all of the glory in Jesus name amen give the Lord praises right now hallelujah